we're waiting a minute or two to allow all participants to join the second day of the Water Institute Research Conference 2020. Can we achieve SDG 6 in the post-COVID world? Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. We're gonna take one, two minutes at the beginning to allow all participants to join us for this second day of the Water Institute Research Conference. We're very happy to have you all on board. And we will start in about one minute. There are still people joining us. I propose we start. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the second day of the Water Institute Research Conference, where we are exploring the theme of whether we can achieve the sustainable development goals, in particular SDG 6, related to clean water and sanitation in a post-COVID world. My name is Roy Brouwer. I'm the executive director of the Water Institute, and I'm joining you from my home today, like many of you. I want to start by acknowledging that we are participating today from traditional territories of the first people across the country. Here in the Waterloo region, I acknowledge that I am on the Haldeman tract land that was promised to the Haudenosaunee of the six nations of the Grand River. The Haldeman tract is within the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. I would encourage you to take a moment to recognize the traditional land where you are. Today's format will include short talks, again, just like yesterday, from three of our panelists, followed by a moderated panel discussion. And before I introduce the panelists for today, I have a few housekeeping items for you. Um, please add your questions to the Q&A box, so not the chat box, but the Q&A box. And you can do this at any time throughout the talk, and we will get to those at the end. Use the chat box for general comments or technical issues. This webinar will be recorded and posted to the Water Institute's YouTube channel afterwards. So as mentioned, also on this second day, we have three excellent panelists for you who agreed to share their insights with us based on their own research and professional experience in the water sector around the world. Yesterday, we started in Australia, then we had a stopover in Singapore, and we finished in India. Today, we want to continue our voyage westwards and pick up in the Middle East and North Africa with Dr. Amal Talbi Jordan from the World Bank. Then we go to Sudan in East Africa with Dr. Ayman Karar, who is an advisor to the Minister of Irrigation and Water Resources of Sudan, someone I worked with on the Nile for many years before coming to Waterloo. And we jump from Sudan to Delft in the Netherlands, in Europe, to Dr. Mark van Loosdrecht, who is Professor of Environmental Biotechnology at the Delft University of Technology. He and I co-chaired the fourth Elsevier Water Conference in Waterloo exactly three years ago in 2017. Without further ado, I will introduce the first panelist now to you, Dr. Amal Talbi Jordan. Dr. Talbi Jordan is the World Bank's Water Resource Management Lead for the Middle East and North Africa. She holds a PhD and master's degree in hydrology, hydrogeology, and geochemistry from the University of Paris in France. Dr. Talbi Jordan has worked on World Bank projects such as the Water Scar Cities Initiative, Climate Risk Assessment in the Niger Basin, and various investment projects on water resources management and development, large-scale infrastructure, water governance, and water scarcity in the Southeast Asia region, Africa region, and she's currently working, as I said, in the Middle East and North African region. Dear Amal, we're very happy to have you here with us today, and I'm happy to hand over the virtual floor to you. Thank you. I am going to share my screen. Thank you. 
thank you very much, everybody. I'm very happy to be in this conference uh, with you all. The purpose of this presentation is to, to share the impact of the COVID in the water sector and the type of inter intervention in, in that sector. So I, I wanted to start by what was the situation of the uh, water sector in the Middle East, North Africa before the COVID. And if you look at the water resources management, we see that there was already a water scarcity. This is the most water scarce re region in, in the world, a high water st uh, stress and the low efficiency and allocation and use. So water productivity for many countries in sectors could be further improved. If you go at the water supply and sanitation, you would look at fragile utilities, meaning the providers of services in many of the countries do not recover even the cost of operation and maintenance. And what we talk about weak social contract really means that you have a lot of network connection in the Middle East, North Africa. However, the quality of service, the numbers of hours, depending on the country, of course, all countries are different, and sometimes it will be three hours a day, for example, of, of water. So already, I would say that the water sector was fragile in, in MENA. And then comes the COVID as yet another shock. So I, I think it's very important to keep in mind, this is about shocks in the system. And you see that in the water resources management for the water scarcity, so the COVID resulted in more demand in water. So suddenly you had already a water scarcity and you add to this water scarcity a, a higher demand. So that, 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 that doesn't help in terms of the, the water stress. Also, we will go a bit in the presentation and see also that there have been, uh, if you have a higher demand, you have to do also allocation to different sectors, taking maybe trying to, to have more water in one sector versus another sector. At the same time, you have more demand in agriculture at the local level. Similarly, for the water supply and sanitation, you had many shocks as well, and that will go more into the, in the presentation, where you have more demand, so the water utility has to deliver more water, but at the same time, either people have less the ability to pay their bills, meaning less revenues to the water utilities, or in some countries there has been decisions to say bills will not be paid on water for a certain amount of time. So already you had this uh, lack of uh, recovering of operation and maintenance, and then comes the COVID and the secondary implications in terms of cost. Unfortunately, the Middle East North Africa region also has other aspects that makes the, the sector weaker. And I will just go quickly, like the refugees, the internally displaced people, which means that you also have settings where you have high density, where you have vulnerable people in camps or outside camps, etc. So all of that results into uh, a COVID pose, posing even more stress to an already difficult situation. And here I just wanted to zoom on the, on the water utilities just, just to show in a way that cycle of how you, you went into the COVID where you have the, the COVID spread, the, fur, the further spreading of the, the COVID-19, which result into lockdown, which result into limitation of the economic uh, sector, etc., which is the secondary impact which means also that you have a decrease in access people. You will have supply chain, for example, of soaps, et cetera, that can be disturbed, which means an, another increase. So just to show that the, the entire like effect and, and cause that just becomes like a difficult uh, situation in a way to, to handle. And, and that means that if no action is taken, uh, you really have, a, you can have a deterioration of service and you can have in some countries uh, even a collapse of the service, again, if no action is taken. I'll go a bit into uh, details also on the water intervention to, to respond. Uh, 
Uh, and in the way on the wash sector, meaning the water and sanitation hygiene, you really have first the aspect of the prevention of the transmission. And we, we talk about COVID, but that would be true for any pandemic. So it's really about how do you respond to shocks that are this type of shock, this pandemic, and really looking at how the immediate and short-term intervention can focus on this aspect. And then you have the recovery phase, which means when you have the medium term actions, and actually those actions are, are really needed in terms of, uh, of the resilience and building the resilience to the, to the sector. And the, the water in, and the water in agriculture, we, we've seen a lot of countries that there has been a, a discussion on this food security concerns over, over the, uh, the supply chain. And as a result, really the critical need to keep this irrigation sector uh, going on, the agriculture sector. And, and again, I will go a bit more in detail. So, so really quickly into the wash, if we look at the immediate and short-term water intervention, so very, very important, we look at the safe services for the hospitals, for example, because we really want to be sure that that, that, that place will have protection to the patient, to the health and, and to, to the staff, and also uh, stop in a way or limit the, the spreading. So how to be sure that not only you have the services, but you have also all the products that are needed. And then the second one, which is the hand washing. I mean, I think everybody has been listening to this hand washing and sing the, at least in, uh, in many countries, how you can sing some songs to be sure that you, you wash your hands uh, sufficient time, uh, etc. So how do you get this, uh, the, the behavior of the, of the people? And also, as, as I was mentioning, how they can have access actually to this water, how they can have access to the soap, how they can have access to, to, to the alcohol-based uh, hand product, for example. And, and the third part is about emergency support to, to secure this access to, wa to water. And it can be really this low cost water services, for example, at least having one point of water in places where they can, uh, people can, can get the water, Ide or, uh, ideally at home, I mean, obviously, but if there is a, a lack of access to water, how at least to have one point where people can, can have access and also support the water utilities. Again, those are the providers and how to be sure that they can deliver the service very, very quickly. Then on the medium term, again, working on the water and sanitation utilities. This is very critical because those are the first responder from a service uh, perspective. And as long as they can deliver the service, then you have really uh, stability in a way in, in, in that sector. And, and experience shows that when you have conflict, country, et cetera, as long as the service provider is able to function, even if it's below the usual level, the recovery is faster. The, while if you have this, the utility collapsing, then whenever you have the recovery, it's much harder to rebuild institutions. So very much whenever there's a conflict a region with high fragility of conflict, you really try to support the utility to keep functioning at a certain level at minimum. Then really how to help the government to uh, strengthen the country system. And by this, we mean, for example, if you have a high demand suddenly in the municipal water, how can you do this water allocation from agriculture, for example, or how you can have your backup system, for example, some countries work more on the water surface, but have a backup on groundwater. So suddenly have your backup system available to respond to peak demands. So that, that's very much this type of, uh, of, of agility. And have, for example, emergency plan, because again, the COVID is one shock. You have other shocks. You can have droughts, you can have floods, you can floods, you can have uh, uh, you can have, for example, uh, we have seen in some countries in MENA, for example, refugees coming. We have seen IDP, so suddenly a governorate in one country will get uh, internally displaced people and will have to respond to a peak demand. 
then the third part is how to support beneficiaries to still have access to services. So uh, how to ensure that keep connected, even if they cannot pay the bill, uh, how to help, uh, how the utility can help in terms of phasing the repayment, uh, providing facility of payment, etc. So it's pretty much into that uh, social side of, uh, of the story. And the fourth point, again, we'll come back a lot to that, the supply chain, how you be sure that the supply chain is not broken. So how to keep, even if it functions not as well as usual time, but at least that chain is, is happening. So for example, for critical hygiene product and, and, and other type. I, I wanted to talk about the water and agriculture as well, because it's the we, we tend to talk about the services in terms of the drinking water, etc. But you also have the, the whole uh, agriculture, for example, in the irrigation, how we can be sure that the service continues despite, uh, despite any pandemic, and in this case, the, the, the COVID. So, for example, you will have also providers, can be water user association working on the irrigation, sometimes it's all the institutions, depending on the, on the country. So the same idea as the utility, how do you help them because they, they have a shock, they have less demand, etc. How you help them in terms of responding, uh, keeping afloat, financially speaking, etc. Um, the second is really how to avoid also the infrastructure to go in, uh, in despair, etc. Same idea as the water sector on the water supply and sanitation. How do you ensure that despite lower demand, from high consumer, low and, and how you can be sure that yet you have the financial ability to at least keep some maintenance, to keep again your water, your, your chain, to have the fuel for the pumps, for example, etc. Um, how you can, again, we go back to the behavior, how we can support the irrigators to continue working on the production safely and have access to, to what they need. And the fourth point, and I think this one is important, is the recovery uh, from the economic with green stimulus packages. So a lot of the uh, actions will be, for example, how you can have this high labor type of activities that at the same time uh, will be within this, this, this green agenda. For example, you can have activities on the watershed, restoring the watershed so you create the job. At the same time, you are providing, again, this is the sustainability from an environmental aspect. So we talk a lot, and the COVID has really bring back this discussion on this uh, recovery, the green, the, the green recovery and the inclusive uh, also recovery. I mean, this is very important. Um, you have really have this social and environmental aspect. So really to, to conclude, uh, I, I really want to say that what, uh, what you see happening is that th this COVID response, really what it shows you is you need to have sound water resources management. And so that the industries, the people, the service provider, be it in agriculture, be it the water utility, etc., have this safe access to water, but at the same time that you preserve the resource because you will use more water. It means that you also have more wastewater and you have to be sure that you are not impacting negatively uh, the environment. And what, what this COVID-19 is, uh, is, is really uh, showing is how you need to actually, as much as possible, have a water sector that is ready to any shock, being a pandemic, being natural shocks, being man-made shocks. So I really want to, 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 to conclude with this, um, in the World Bank, we have the global practice, the water global practice strategic action plan. And we always have these three pillars. We come back to sustain the water resource, really having this water allocation, preserving the resource from a quantity and a quality point of view, then delivering the service. Again, the social contract with people because they need social contract in the water sector from all where the water sector is involved, industry, uh, agriculture, drinking water, sanitation, etc. 
And last but not least, because those are really three parallel track, is building the resilience. Have to have a water sector that can be ready to this shock and really uh, over time being more and more resilient because we have many shocks happening um, in the future. Again, we see the climate change, more uncertainty, etc. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amal, for this enlightening presentation. Thank you. Um, we will wait with taking questions after we had all the three presentations. So those of you attending and maybe uh, logging in a little bit later um, into this virtual conference, please use the Q&A functionality in Zoom to ask your questions. We will quickly move on to the second panelist um, mm. of today, Dr. Ayman Kassar. Uh, Dr. Ayman Kassar is a natural scientist with over 20 years of experience in water governance. She is the advisor to the Minister of Irrigation and Water Resources of Sudan. Uh, Dr. Karar is the editor of the book Freshwater Governance for the 21st Century and she is an executive board member of the International Water Resources Association and serves on the scientific program committee for the Stockholm World Water Week. Week. Uh, Eman, um, I'm also very happy that you could join us here today in this uh, conference from Khartoum. I'm going to hand over the virtual floor to you. Um, in your case, we're going to run a pre-recorded video which I believe you will share with us now. Yes, thanks Roy and hello everyone. Uh, I've got my presentation ready, so I will just um, share my screen just now um, and go into the presentation. Good morning, colleagues. This is uh, Iman Karrar, and I'm so pleased to be joining you today. Um, I will be speaking about um, inclusive governance for IWRM implementation post-COVID-19. Um, and this is um, reflecting. Hey, man, I cannot hear you anymore. Okay, sure so I'll keep the video on. I'm not sure if, uh, if this is the case for every, anyone else. I can see the, vid, I can see the slide, but I cannot hear you. Um, to start off with, as an advisor, uh, you might be curious, what am I doing as advisor to the Minister of um, Irrigation and Water Resources in Sudan? Uh, this is what I spend most of my days on, and maybe it will help in the discussion later for joint uh, research and so on, is to um, trying to... I'm losing the sound again. I'm not sure if everyone else has the same problem, but I, I, I don't hear anything anymore. And I also see that the screen of the one has frozen. Okay, and I hear, thank you. I, I, I hear from others as well that there is no sound anymore. Hey, mom, can you hear me? It, it appears that we have lost Ayman. And now she's completely gone. I don't see her on my screen anymore at all. So that is very unfortunate. Um, I propose that we um, try to reconnect with her behind the screen. Um, Ali or um, Kevin, if you can try to get back in contact with um, Ayman, that would be great. Um, and I propose we give that a minute or so while I try to break the silence during that minute by keep on talking. And um, if we are able to get her back in within a, in the next couple of minutes, then we can continue with her. If not, I propose we, we, we move quickly to the third panelist, which is Mark van Loostrecht, um, who's still online, I see. And um, I, I don't hear anything from the... 
producer, so I I suspect that it may take us a little bit longer to get Eamon back. Hi, Roy. Why don't we move to Mark, and in the meantime, we'll try to get Iman back online. Sounds very good. Mark, are you are you there? Are you are you happy to share your screen with us? Shall I introduce you first, and then and then you take take over? Yep. And someone yeah. has to turn on my video, but uh, yep. Ali will Ali will do that. I can share. Okay. Let me then um, introduce you, and then and then we we continue with your presentation. So. Thank you very much, Mark, for, for being here with us, um, for everyone who's, who's online with us. Uh, professor Mark van Lothert is a professor of bi environmental biotechnology at the Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands, where he has spent more than 30 years working on improvements in wastewater systems and resource recovery all over the world. He was awarded the prestigious 2012 Singapore Water Prize, um, and in 2018, he received the Stockholm Water Prize for revolutionizing water and wastewater treatment. Professor Van Loosdrecht's scientific interests are related to biofilm processes, nutrient conversion processes, and the role of storage polymers in microbial ecology. He's a member of the Dutch, USA, and Chinese Academies of Engineering. He published over 800 scientific papers, uh, has 20 patents, and has supervised over 60 PhD students. Mark, we're very happy to also have you here with us today. Please take the virtual floor. Okay, um, well, thank you, and as always, happy to share and discuss about our uh, approaches and ideas developed in the, in the lab, and uh, uh, today on resource recovery from wastewater, and uh, due to, of course, the present uh, situation, the, um, the, uh, the question has been, what would be the impact of uh, COVID, and um, uh, just some remarks and ideas about COVID and the Sustainable Development Goal number six, especially. I think, in my opinion, COVID mainly puts wastewater back as a kind of uh, important aspect of uh, sanitation. Uh, wastewater can be a mirror of, of the health situation in the population, and there's where the major impact change on the long run, to me, will be, because most of the other aspects uh, related to Sustainable Development Goal 6, uh, they might be enhanced uh, due to the corona situation as introduced in the first uh, lecture before me, uh, but still um, many of them will remain after corona and will not, they will not be in this respect a big paradigm change in my view. Um, the, and uh, to put it briefly, if we talk about sanitation, um, I don't think it's a lack of engineering. It's not a lack of technology. It's, in my view, uh, in most places of the world, mainly a lack of financing. And uh, that lack of financing is not because sanitation is very expensive, but it becomes ex expensive if you... Um, so it's not expensive in a country like the Netherlands, where the interest rates are virtually zero. We can do an investment for 25 years and pay off and everybody will believe that the Netherlands government will pay off in 25 years. Um, for most of the other countries, it's a bit different because there's usually not a kind of reliance that money will be paid back anyway, and certainly not in 25 years, resulting in very high interest rates, meaning that if you do an investment in long-term infrastructure, it becomes extremely expensive and difficult. So it's, it's mainly a governmental problem but then still I'm an engineer and what we try to do is see if we can solve this in our way by in one way uh, develop cheaper technology uh, so that the investments can decrease and at the second way, uh, aspect to see if there's kind of revenue generation so that handling wastewater in the end can be a kind of revenue generating activity instead of an activity which needs money which is in the end always easier to implement in societies with weak governments. Um, so what we're looking at is how can we integrate wastewater treatment and circular economy and what are the options for that? And there are um, the typical examples are, of course, we can recover water and that's actually the prime task and besides providing sanitation. Um, uh, the point here is that water is of interest, but it will hardly generate revenue because in many places water is 
seen as something which should be uh, delivered at no cost or really marginal cost because of the role it plays as a as basic need and basic good in society. Um, we can try to recover some energy, but these amounts are relatively small and might be just enough to drive the treatment process itself. So we'll not generate revenue, but might decrease the cost. Nutrients is important, certainly in those places where import of nutrients is, is difficult, in places where import of nutrients is important. Um, this might not be that relevant. But the point which is often neglected is uh, the, the potential conversion of the organic carbon into chemicals. And chemicals have the advantage over the other recovery I just mentioned with usually a much higher um, added value. And I will come back to that uh, later. Um, so <clears throat> we have been mainly working on um, all kinds of technologies and not only we, many groups have been working on technologies around resource recovery. And one of our current PhD students, Philip Kerang, is, uh, has been evaluating many of them. And in these diagrams, you see technologies which are explained in the um, uh, literature on, on water recovery, fertilizer recovery, energy recovery, and uh, organic carbon recovery. And the gray ones are the ones which uh, are really used in practice. And the blue ones are still in the blue sky, you could say. And you can observe that for water reclamation technologies, there's quite a lot of technologies which are implemented, which are used. Of course, related to the fact that in many areas of the world, there's a water shortage and recovering the wastewater is, is helping to minimize the water shortage. Um, this remains in most cases, however, uh, as mentioned before, expensive needing investments and the complication of how to do cost recovery on the long run uh, and cost recovery not only for the investments but also to pay the employees which have to run the facilities. Fertilizer recovery, energy recovery, there are some aspects going on and actually if you would look in more detail most of the fertilizer recovery is uh, going on has more to do with um, management improvement of the plants than with really um, fertilizer recovery. Energy recovery is mainly to minimize the energy cost of the plant and minimize sludge processes and chemicals recovery is still in its, its infancy. Why are there so many ideas and suggestions already for a while, not just the last few years? And why is there not that much breakthrough? And that is um, the that resource recovery practice. And now I talk very much from the Dutch or Northwestern European perspective, where most of the resource recovery projects are running in the world, um, that many of the water utilities which are actually doing at the moment are mainly motivated by it, they, that they also want to be, um, have a good image in public perception that they contribute to circle economy and other things. So it's more politically motivated than economically or management motivated. And as I mentioned already, for water, there, there's clear advantages. Phosphate is usually done because it improves sludge uh, dewatering or it minimizes scaling and other problems in the treatment plant. Energy, the same thing, it, it optimizes energy use at the treatment plant, minimize sludge production. And um, there is some projects going on on cellulose, which is a chemical, of course but that's also motivated by lower sludge production. So actually, if you look to most of the resource recovery issues at the moment, they are internal driven by internal drivers inside the water utilities, uh, motivated by external political aspects, but really not uh, really by circle economy aspects, by economy aspects in that sense. And that will be needed in order to make it uh, um, more there. Now, there are there's one basic bottleneck, if you think about it, because um, as well for the energy market, but there I'd say it's a small part, but certainly for the fertilizer and for the chemical market, these markets are not adapted to the way um, if you start to make products from wastewater treatment plants um, is functioning. If you look to uh, polymers or the chemicals production, um, you have oil, you produce uh, a huge amount of fertilizer, chemicals in a big factory, supply almost all of Europe from one factory. 
and then distribute to the consumers. Whereas here it will be different because if you recover material from waste or treatment plants, you have many places where there's production units the will and the whole logistics is actually not existing. And the, here's one of the aspects where interdisciplinarity needs to be added more. That is not only environmental engineering, making resource recovery, but it's also a good thing about logistics and economy of how to organize um, this recovery of material on many sites, bringing it together, making a product out of it again. And um, the second complicating factor here is that sewage has no value so it's a public good but as soon as something gets value there is always a demand that it should be a market good and there is a public private boundaries which are also not clarified how to deal with that because usually public authorities deliver services and not products and that's uh, if you start thinking about it also leads to all kind of political problems um, so that's one of the bottlenecks for introducing really resource recovery out of wastewater. The other bottleneck is the not well recognition of what a recovered product really means. Uh, so there's not good recognition of markets and demands or supply and demand. Um, the idea was in the environmental engineering is very often if we recover uh, phosphate and we put it in front of the gate, uh, there are so many people who are very happy to come and collect it, but this might work for copper or for waste scrap iron, but for nutrients, this only works if there's a link, the lack of nutrients, but for certainly on the Western societies, there is not really a lack of nutrients. In some poor societies, this could be the case. Um, what is the point here is that the, the amount of phosphate, uh, so um, the left-hand slide indicates uh, in red, what the total phosphate consumption is, in this case for the Flanders region from a paper from Philippe. Um, and in blue, what is the potential supply from the phosphate in the influent? And then you see that on the total phosphate markets, the wastewater plants might have about 10% of the total. So you're a small player in the market. And that's never the best way to be influential or to get a decent price. Um, so <clears throat> overall, what has to be done is find niche markets where you can supply your phosphate or your nutrients in a way that there's an advantage of it so that you can have added value. And this line of thinking is not really there in general. Um, there are several other products where we are working on. That one is alginate-like uh, material called, called Chimera. One is polyhydroxyalkanoates. Um, other is potential to recover cellulose and par partially the CO2 certainly from the biogas plants could be used for uh, chemical consumption. Um, in the case of uh, polymers, there is the interesting thing that uh, uh, extracellular polymers, in this case Chimera, you could be uh, market dominated. In the bioplastics market, there could be a significant part. So there, if you recover these materials from wastewater, there can be a strong um, market share and even a market dominance. Whereas for cellulose, for instance, it's interesting to recover. It's very easy to recover. But again, you will have to find uh, uh, applications which have value. So I will come back to that in, in a minute. The second part from the wastewater point of view is that if we, uh, where now the resource recovery is, is kind of scattered, everybody tries to get an individual product recovered and advertises that uh, they're better in evaluation and integrated evaluation of the total plant has to be made because as soon as you, for instance, start to recover polymers, um, you will have less um, uh, space for energy recovery. So one recovery will limit the recovery of another resource and that has to be balanced and also methods to optimize there and also to be able to, to be, be flexible in handling the different resource you can recover depending on market demand has to be introduced. And again, that's a different line of thinking because what utilities think as being a service provider and they would have, if this is going to happen, become a kind of really resource product uh, provider instead of a service provider. And that's a different mentality. Um, one of the aspects uh, we have been looking at, I think I still have some time, yes, is um, uh, related to uh, a new treatment plant, Nereda. Um, 
on the left hand picture you see uh, a wastewater treatment plant in the Netherlands. On the top uh, part you see an old fashioned wastewater treatment plant. In the bottom the two plants tanks is a new plant near Ada. And the advantage of the plant is very clear because both facilities here treat the amount, the same amount of wastewater. So you see that the Nareda plant in the bottom is much more compact uh, <coughs> than the top plant. But moreover, it uses much less, has no mixers, only an influent pump and no uh, return sludge pumps, return flow pumps. So the amount of mechanical equipment is much less, which means there's much less need for imports of expensive equipment, which means total investment costs are lower. Moreover, more of the material can be produced locally instead of that it has to come from international markets, which is an advantage if you want to invest and build mm -hmm. these kind of infrastructures. There's also less need for concrete, which is of course an, an added value. Now in these plants, the trick is that the bacteria don't grow as, gran as flocks, but as granules. And these granules, they are formed by bacteria which produce a gelling polymer. And that gelling polymer, which has uh, properties similar to alginates, is interesting because this kind of polymers cannot be made out of oil. These gelling polymers can only be biologically derived and the whole world market uh, currently is supply limited and not demand limited. So the prices are relatively high simply because there's a limited amount of supply. Now, the amount of polymers we can get out of a wastewater treatment plant um, is huge compared to the existing market. This means that potentially we can, the prices will go down because if supply increases uh, and start to fill demand, prices might go down. But that's to see for the future and we're trying, of course, to look for new applications. Now, currently there, we are on a demo scale. Uh, th these polymers, they are uh, in, in um, extracted and we give them the name Chimera and that's a demo plant in the Netherlands on the right hand side, which produces around, up, which can produce up to 500 tons of this material per year. So that becomes in really industrial amounts. Now, the interesting thing of these polymers is that we have to be starting to look for how can we use them in, in a sensible way. And one of this is that if you mix these polymers with clay, you make a special material which looks like the material from shells, nacre. Material which has unique properties, too long to discuss. But <clears throat> one of the examples where it's used for is as a curing agent in um, cement, in, in concrete production. The, this application means that you need less water in the construction industry, saving water again, and you potentially need about five to 10% less cement, which is again, a saving in, in uh, CO2 emissions, but also in, in materials you need in production. And the other aspect, another uh, product we look at, that's uh, uh, Suellen works on that, another PhD student in the group, I better make her visible and put to Delft behind my screen, um, um, is to mix the polymers with the cellulose. At the treatment plant, you can recover cellulose and the advantage of the cellulose recover at the treatment plants, at least in the Netherlands, where we flush our toilet paper through the toilets, um, <coughs> is that this cellulose is already delignified. And in order to make nanocellulose, you first need to delignify. So if you from the recovered cellulose, make nanocellulose, you have the advantage that you don't need to pay for the delignification because that's already done by um, the, the, cell, the toilet paper users. Now, the interesting thing is that if you mix the nanocellulose again with this polymer, this chimera, you get a material which looks like mother of pearl. You see your oyster shell with next to it, something made out of toilet, recovered toilet paper and bacterial slime, and you see it, it gives a nice, uh, aspect ratio, you might make jewelry out of it. You can find a nice video on that in the right hand side. If you Google it, you will find that video. Uh, but the interesting thing is this material, the clay one, but also the, the color has very good binding capacities, but gives a plastic material, which is non-burnable. So we can make plastics which have anti-flame retardant or non-flammable characteristics. And another aspect, I mentioned this already, the polymer binds very well with clay and loam. This means that if you want to build constructions from loam, which is quite around in the world, um, enforcing these loam bricks 
with the polymer, makes them more durable, less sensitive to rain. And that could be an interesting part in places of the world for recovery in places of the world where loam constructions are still used in, in building. And also there, a PhD student is looking on the use of these polymers in loam constructions, mainly in India. So for those who are, you are interested to, to read about our thoughts and ideas about uh, resource recovery potentials from wastewater treatment plant, Philippe has published in the meantime a, a suit of papers and I just put them up here so you can make a screenshot and look them up if you're interested. And with that, I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mark. That was a very nice overview. And um, you talk like an economist talking about demand and supply. Uh, it warms my heart. It, it, it sounds very good. Thank you. Um, we, we have, um, so as I mentioned, we'll have questions at the end. Ayman managed to get connected to us again as well. I propose we still continue with her presentation, but then Ayman, if you don't mind, um, just talk to your slides and, and, and we don't show the video recording because the sound also disappeared uh, now and again. So Ayman, if you are still able to share your screen with us, then I propose we, we continue with your presentation. Um, can you share? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, you can. Yes, yes thanks. Um, thanks, Roy. Um, I think I will, um, I will share the screen and uh, the only version I have is the recorded one. So please bear with it. Um, it's if, if there are problems, just tell me. I don't have one that doesn't have the sound. Okay, so let's see how it goes. My internet just uh, decided to disappear at that point. So that's why it didn't work. Okay, that's... So there is no sound, Ayman. We, we cannot there hear... There is no sound. No. Okay. You're so not I able to... Yeah, can you not um, uh, click I can. through it and then I just can. talk to it maybe? Yes, yes, because I can hear it here. So um, I think I will, I will proceed. Um, and looking at the IWRM implementation um, um, and how it's connected to other, to other SDGs, uh, as we know, water is the connector, and there, is a, there are major um, implications to a number of, of other uh, SDG deliveries. Um, talking about the current water issues, I believe that um, there is, um, these are um, shared uh, maybe with many countries, the increased demands on water, the more pronounced extreme events, um, aspiration policies where implementation is lagging behind water resources and water services legislation, you know, not looked at as a whole value chain. Um, the importance of coordination with other natural, uh, natural resources um, and also the focus, uh, more focus on water resources, on uh, groundwater uh, than, the, uh, than surface water. And, uh, and um, the pricing of water, sustainability of uh, the institutional sustainability, uh, and of course the relevant, uh, very relevant on the emergent diseases um, and water um, health uh, nexus. Uh, when it comes to the uh, challenges in implementing IWRM, um, and in the context of Sudan and probably Sub-Saharan Africa uh, in a similar situation is the difficulty to integrate the management uh, of water and other natural resources, um, the lack of um, adequate formal mechanisms for participation and coordinating activities at all um, scales, persistent need for sharing adequate information to allow for participation, um, lack of IWRM plans, which is the major uh, indicator for implementing IWRM, the institutional misfit and sometimes fragmentation to fulfilling water management as a whole, um, the difficulty in producing multidisciplinary trained uh, professionals, uh, the focus uh, still on the demand on the supply side, the engineering kind of solutions, the suboptimal level of participation, especially uh, from the 
the bottom of the triangle of the local level. Uh, when we speak to uh, changes becoming the new norm. Uh, in wash uh, campaigns, we had wash your hands, now you have to wash your hands more. Uh, climate change is bringing um, the, 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 the type of change that is becoming so visible, so um, pronounced. Um, and I think no matter how long it is, you know, we can't get used to it. I mean, the recent floods that we had in Sudan um, had something to do with um, a lot of rain um, in, in, the, in the upper reaches of the Nile, which affected many, many families and uh, swept away many homes. Um, also into season of variability, which is also bringing uh, the dimensions of increased conflicts, especially between those who rely on pastures and move around um, and move around um, uh, for with their animals, uh, with their cattle, um, for grazing. Uh, so the change in the rainfall patterns has, has uh, created a situation where they move into sedentary agricultural land um, where there is um, conflict. Uh, the pandemic also, it's, uh, we can think of cholera, which is also a seasonal outbreaks, uh, depending on the rainfall, and there is a lot of rainfall, at least in, in these parts of the world, as well as malaria. So COVID comes on top of that with new dimensions, that time is of the essence, and also um, that the, the transmission is so quick. So um, access to water and um, water and sanitation systems becoming a core public health uh, re requirement. Um, increased uh, complexity and vulnerabilities obviously is quite, um, is, 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 is on the increase. Now I'm trying with these reflections to think about, um, um, you know, a conceptual framing for this and I see four very important aspects that we look at based on the uh, economically deprived and politically deprived. And this is the majority, the masses that we have in our countries. And here we have access to the resource itself, to water itself, but also the reliability and the, and the safety of the water that is available. Um, the improved water governance for reduced uh, conflicts and the improved access to science, which is quite important. And this is what I, I submit that the science, the information, the creation of knowledge enhances the participation um, of, 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 uh, of communities. And of course, we have the, the, various, um, um, the various dimensions that are part and parcel of, of, uh, of, of, these, um, of these four axes, uh, the institutional side, the planning side, the capacity building and the policy side. When we come to the, um, the various governance dimensions that we have at play, is that a lot of focus on equity, equity in access um, to water and more important now, as I said, to safe, safe clean, clean drinking water. The inclusion in decision-making platforms, which is absolutely critical for engaging in um, how how water is made um, accessible, how it's made available. And here we refer to the institutional um, platforms that allows for, for decision-making. Transparency, accountability are both uh, very essential in decision-making and it also brings about the, the kind of um, the rights approach that we have now, which we had for quite some time, and it's a right to have access to water and so on, but still we find that we have a large portion of our populations that do not have access. If it's to water, it's not safe water. If it is safe water, then it's not, it's not enough, not enough quantities. Um, and I think um, the, 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 the focus now from a governance that I mentioned with the COVID-19 is becoming more sharp in trying to ensure um, how we achieve that. Information sharing is, is essential for leveling the playing field and enhancing inclusion and participation in decision making. Um, the other is the digital economy. And I mean, I've been uh, just now a victim of that where, <laughs> um, you know, the, 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 
uh, the, the digital infrastructure that we have in various countries where it can either enable you to participate and participate at all levels, uh, whether you are an academic or whether you are in the field or whether you are trying to upload a, uh, a reading, a water quality reading, whatever participation it is. If you don't have that base um, um, in, in, a, in a good, uh, good level, it's very difficult for a person to participate. And, and if the internet is not that strong, then you have that, that problem. And, and in, when you don't participate, then you are excluded from the decision-making and your vulnerability is even more. We're looking at vulnerabilities also with the COVID-19 to those who have compromised um, health conditions such as HIV, the, the disability discussion about access to water is even becoming more if you need to wash your hands even more and have um, access to clean water, as well as the gender dimension of women who are predominantly working in the health and social work. I, I, I think we lost her again. I think we lost Ayman again, and it was going so well. Okay, let's. So, so we're we're approaching nine o'clock. We've we've got um, twenty five minutes or so left for for discussion. Um, I I propose we um, we continue with the um, with, with with the discussion. Um, and um, if Ayman can can still join us, then um, then that would be great. Maybe she can she can then jump into the discussion as well. While Ayman was um, was talking, and I'll, I'll I'll kick off the discussion, and then Nancy, I, if, if there are any questions from from the audience, please use the Q and A. Um, just type in the question, and um, and if you have one for um, Amal or for. Or Mark, just type in your question and then we'll, we'll ask that question to them. But let me kick it off. I, I was thinking while Ayman was talking about access to water and sanitation, it's, it, it was a common theme also, Amal, with what you were talking about. And, and Mark started off his presentation with, with the cost effectiveness um, also of these um, resource recovery tech technologies. I, I, I was just wondering, um, and this is maybe a very broad um, uh, question to start off the discussion, but um, do you see any potential for, for technology transfer? There's the, the technology seems to be there. The demand for um, these scarce water resources um, um, has only increased. The supply is under increasing pressure. Ayman, you're back. I'm back. I don't know what happened. I'm sorry. Don't worry. It's the digital economy. I, I just kicked <laughs> off the, the, the discussion. Um, okay. Do you do you want to finish your presentation and and then I'll 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 stop talking now. You finish your presentation and then we 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 continue with the discussion. I, I just have my last slide, if you don't mind, which I all. would like to 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 share with the meeting. Um, share screen. I hope I don't jinx it again. Um, I promise I'll be quick. I share. Um, uh, can you, can you? Yeah, we see it. You see it? Yes. Okay, you can't hear the, the noise, the sound? No. Okay. So I speak to it and so here it's just looking at the, um, who is affected um, in all this discussion, you know, apart from the digital economy and the exclusion that is a part of that. Um, there is also, this is the, those who, who, the voiceless are the ones that are most excluded in this sense. So I just want to focus on this one, uh, on what are the pointers? What do we want to do differently? And I think uh, looking at the diverse sources of information and, uh, and, and our, um, our essential 
uh, mind changing of the mindset that we need information, not uh, uh, the, the indigenous knowledge as such, but lo the local knowledge, the local, local expertise as complementary and very closely related to our formal education. And that's the only way that we will be able to, um, to address and, and, and uh, respond to these shocks, as, as uh, Amal was saying. The digital economy barrier to equity and participation, you've just witnessed that, I'm not going to explain that one. And the linkage across skills through appropriate mechanisms, especially in federal, in federal systems. And I'm hoping to learn more because Sudan is in a transitional state and we are setting or putting our systems um, in place. Adaptive risk management acknowledging complexity. Complexity is all before us, change is the new norm, and we have to be really fast and really quick in how, how we respond uh, to, these, uh, uh. to these risks. The co-produced solutions between the public servants and citizens, and I think we have good experience at, at project level, but we need to see this as a mindset of the, even the public servants as they serve in the various countries. The governance and institutions for, um, for uh, appropriate and equitable representation, taking the gender dimension into consideration. And then lastly, uh, but not leastly, is broadening the definition of exclusion. So it's not only sexuality or, or occupation or tribe or geographic location or ability, it's, it, it goes further into uh, compromised health like the HIV and also the high risk professionals and the, and the lack of access to the safe water. I think these are just my, some of the reflections. Thanks, Roy. Thank you very much, Ayman. And we're very happy that you're still with us here. Um, <laughs> this was very, um, this was very good. Thank you so much. And I'm, I'm, I'm very sorry for the, for the interruptions to those of you also listening in, but I, I think it was important that we finished this presentation as well um, and and so I'll, I'll kick off the, the the discussion and then if you have any questions please type them in the Q&A box then you can um, then we can ask them to to the panelists um, I, I was gonna I started off already um, introducing my first question listening to Amal and uh, to Ayman and, uh, and and to Mark one of the things that crossed my mind was uh, technology transfer so there is record, resource recovery uh, technology being developed um, that seems to be effective, that maybe seems to be cost effective as well, although Mark was pointing out that um, economic considerations might not always be the, the, the main motivation for, uh, for res resource recovery. Um, my, my question to all three of you would be, um, how do you perceive this? Is, is technology transfer, uh, technology that, for example, is developed by Mark's group, would that be part of the solution to... Um, ensure um, that there is access to clean and safe drinking water uh, using those resource recovery technologies. And, and if you think it is, what, what would be needed um, at national, regional, or maybe even at international level to facilitate that? Um, I, I'm, I'm thinking what came to my mind is, um, and that's, that's close here to, to home, there is a so-called Montreal Protocol that was signed in the 1980s or 1990s, I believe, to, to finance technology transfer related with the emission um, of uh, substances that um, uh, impaired our ozone layer. Um, and, and so there was an international forum that allowed such a technology transfer to, to, uh, to take place. I, I'm, I don't know how successful it was, but anyway, there was an international agreement on that. Any thoughts maybe on that from, from any of you? Ayman. Um, thanks, Roy. I think it's it's a very it's a very relevant uh, question, and and we have to think of of change. Uh, the the resilience is built over time to adapt to gradual changes, and we have communities that have done that beautifully over long years. You know, so adaptation takes a lot of time. But now we have to really respond, and change is coming um, so fast. So I think this is where. Partnerships, and I think SDG 17 comes to mind. But um, the the um, not the technology transfer is uh, extremely important as immediate solution. So, and with the <laughs> the digital um, uh, capabilities, we can uh, shop around and review the various and so on, and 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 see where is the appropriate for um, selection or choice for the context. The other is that to broaden the, the, the transfer term, 
that it's not only technology, but it's actually the research, the researchers creating partnerships, coming up with solutions that could uh, be applicable even at the regional level, because the, the, the issues are quite similar, if you like. Um, and we can group the whole world into packages that could um, very much utilize many, many of the solutions that are found elsewhere. So uh, allowing the platforms, allowing the protocols, allow really be serious about that. It's not a nice to have, it's not about the taking the trip to go somewhere. It's really about um, finding solutions. And if we have to do it by ourselves individually, it will take a long time and probably that is not, it's not very wise. So it's something to the policymakers, but also something to the researchers to open up um, even more. And I think with this technology, uh, it's the cost is so much minimized in terms of, of uh, going into shared uh, joint research projects and so on. So that's it. Thank you, Ayman. M Mark, do you have any thoughts on this? Yes, I have thoughts on that. So maybe a bit deviating from the mainstream in general, but because on first hand, I don't believe tech transfer is any limit. That's uh, if you look in Europe around 1817, 1880, more than 150 years ago, we were capable to bring in sanitation and get rid of typhoid and cholera. The economy in Europe at that time, the level of technology in Europe at that time is well below all the other areas currently in the world. So it's not a matter of technology. It's a matter of social political context and technology which has to be designed within that social political context, because you can say on one hand, then adopt, uh, adapt the political systems or the social systems to the way things are running, or adapt your technology development to that, that issue. And uh, as I said, my talk, one of the issues is that if we cons make a construction year and we invest for 25 years, it, and we pay back in 25, pay off in 25 years instead of two or three years, it makes the technology very cheap. But as soon as you have to pay back immediately because nobody believes that in 10 years there's the same government which is willing to pay back, um, your interest rates are high, etc. That is where the problem sits. So that means that either you have to develop the technology which takes that into account um, so that you have much more decentralized so you can rely on small patches of investments instead of huge investments as here um, or in other ways that's uh, so that it's not so much tech transfer it's much more um, understanding much better what what are the design criteria under which you design not from the engineering space but from the social economic space and that is usually neglected it's thought well the way we treat wastewater here we can do everywhere but this aspect is not taken into account and that that's that that there i fully agree better understanding of this and better interaction of, of researchers and uh, design engineers could help there because that generates then of course the creativity and the, the thinking power to make adapt uh, solutions which are locally embedded in the local uh, social economic context. Yeah. It's a very good point. We learned a lot of course of the green revolution in the 1970s already as well where there was this technology transfer that didn't really work out um, and, and where exactly that happened, what you were saying. Um, um, Amal, do you have any thinking on this as well that you would like to share with us? Absolutely. And, and I, I do agree that technology usually is not the main, the transfer is not the main bottleneck. It's, uh, it's one aspect. And when we were working on the Water Scare Cities Initiative, actually what you realized was that uh, the, it was more for political economy issue. It's what's happening in the energy sector, what's happening in the agriculture sector that will provide those incentive or disincentive. And the Water Scare Cities Initiative was looking actually at examples of practitioner where it's really what was the event that made the change. And I think that's what is important and really speak to what Iman and Mark was saying. How do you make the change? On the technology, one aspect that's important is that sometimes it allows you to leapfrog so that's an opportunity that we need to look at. And sometimes with digital, it opens also areas on doing more governance. We look at the groundwater governance. All these new technologies actually help you do things that cannot were not possible 15 years ago. Over. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amal. Um, I, I think in the meantime, we've, we've got a question in the Q&A. Nancy, can I hand over to you? Yep. 
Thank you. Um, so this is from Marion in Ghana. She directs it to Iman, but perhaps others might want to comment as well. So in a changing and digitally fast paced world, in which ways are the voiceless who are the most vulnerable being reached in Sudan? So as we know, digitization uh, does not reach this vulnerable group often and government can overlook them not only in Sudan but other parts of the world um, thanks Nancy and thanks uh, Marian for the question and I think um, Sudan is a is a probably a reflection of other other similar countries uh, when when we say is the digitization to the water management has not really gone to the local level. Um, I am uh, hoping and aspiring that we will uh, enhance, um, enhance the participation um, um, of, of, uh, of, of the local um, communities. Uh, firstly, by trying to create the enabling environment. I think we're not in a stage to get to the, um, to the, to the discussion of the, of the digital um, digital economy yet, but it is uh, an, an, a, a very essential part. At this stage, we would like to make sure that we change the mindset of those who engage and interact with, with, uh, with the communities as water managers, that w there is value in listening. So we don't go and just say and tell people, this is what you have to do, but also to listen and create a sense of uh, partnership. And I think this is, this is so, so important. We have an experience in Awad al which in which we created such a platform and the partnership was so empowering to both parties actually, to making action happen on the ground with very little resources. And, 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 and for now, this is working. Obviously in Sudan, the digital economy is, is, is enabling in the urban setting. And I think there is good participation and so on in, in, that, in that sense. But there, there are lessons to learn from various projects that we have in the country. Thank you. Thank you. Nancy, I think you have another question. Or do you want me to ask a question? Uh, yeah, I can yeah. go. So um, we have another question. Uh, we've talked around this, but um, the importance of building resilience, especially as we notice, you know, in times of crises like COVID, um, there's a lot of, of talk around the importance of building resilience. Um, how, how have you noticed this? Um, have you noticed resilience to become part of the response plans in your own um, experiences? And can you maybe give some examples of what we might want to do to build resilience moving forward? Who are you going to ask this? Well, uh, who wants to start? I, I think it's a general question that everyone could answer. I, I can start maybe, yes. So, I mean, the first thought I have on this one is we have to say, don't waste the crisis. And in a way, the COVID and other crises are stress tests to your system. So you can see what works and what doesn't work or can needs to, to be improved. Examples of resilience, one, one aspect that uh, we've been discussing a lot is the whole financial discussion on the water sector. Um, so you have to increase the revenues. So that's one part of it and how you do it in a way that you don't impact too much the vulnerables because that, that's the, the, the issue. So the linkage between social protection programs to support vulnerable people and any change of uh, tariff structure, etc. So that's very important because the water sector has to increase its revenues, as Mark said, to be able to provide the confidence for more private sector participation. If we want to achieve the SDG 6, unfortunately, it means also that it needs more private sector capital. And that means that you need to have more credibility, have more trust that your sector will be able to repay. So that's one part. And then, for example, in the digital aspect, the whole uh, one thing that COVID has bring is the whole digital. So the whole discussion on e-payment, the whole discussion um, on how to work remotely 
I mean, now we all do our work remotely. I work on Iraq, I work, uh, uh, um, I work on Lebanon, I work in Morocco, and all the e-procurement. So the procurement now is done a lot in e-procurement, even on places where usually it was difficult to work on um, digital. So those are examples, and I think really COVID has uh, extended that discussion over. Thank you, Amal. Uh, Mark, do you want to respond to it? You, you were talking about these high interest rates um, uh, from the private sector. They, they want to see their, their return on their investment. How, how do you see this? Yeah, so I, I'm not a definition private or public se sector. In the end, the public has to pay. And whatever you do, whether you do this to the private or not. So you might also think about, can you design and organize the system in the way that the public can pay? Because that will in the end be cheaper because there's no profit going to the private sector. I understand all problems with raising large amounts. So, but I, I would not say one or the other. Um, but it is, uh, this is what sets whether you are able, because large scale uh, systems like we have here, they, they have a big e economic advantage, but they have the big disadvantage of, yeah, you need to be reliable, you need to have a uh, maintenance systems. Uh, it's even not a problem for the World Bank, for instance, to install wastewater treatment plants. It's usually then the problem to keep the, the pumps there because the labor at the treatment plant doesn't get sufficient payments and find other ways to at least earn a little bit of money from the things which are at the treatment plant or, you know, in some ways. It, this kind of things are much more difficult to do. So that's why design linked to, to local issues are there. And, I, uh, and the other point is um, uh, uh, to be, I fully agree that uh, water is, is say a, a basic human right, you could call it. At the same time, uh, I don't think it's a basic hum human right that is brought to your do doorstep and it's, um, you should also be able to organize a system where, because if, if something is for free or because human right, it's for free, it has no value. It, it's also perceived as no value. So, uh, if you want to save water and it's the same, uh, maybe even more worse in the agriculture sector, uh, because on one hand, pr producing food is extremely needed. At the same time, yeah, if you provide irrigation water more or less for free or in, in other ways, then there's no economic boundary there to minimize that. Um, there's where the big water losses are if you talk about water resources. So this better integration of how you handle the technical system with the economic boundaries and inter yeah, design based on what is there and not on some ideal situation might help a lot. And that's indeed not just transplanting, but think about it. And yeah, overall COVID, uh, uh, from my point of view, it, it, as is mentioned before, I don't think that will change a lot, except uh, the, the, one of the first tasks of the water system is, of course, supply water, but also supply health to the society. And what has become clear again is that it is known, it was known, because for some things it is it's monitored that using the wastewater system as a kind of mirror of the health of the population, uh, not only for COVID, but for many other aspects, might help in improving the general health system. And again, if you have um, clear also advantage on the health side of your system, there might also be from that point of view reasons to invest in the water system. So better integration with the, the health function of the whole sanitation sector with the medical sector um, could also lead to benefits, which um, makes systems easier to be uh, fin financed. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, Ayman, would you like to react to this? Um, it's a lot of things that have been said, and I think uh, to um, to relate that to resilience, um, I, I agree with most of what was said. Um, I think homegrown solutions are essential, uh, but at the same time, we don't have the time to resilience over time. Resilience is, is a natural process. I mean, we have communities that adapt to really very, if I look, and I recently I had work that uh, I've done for Yemen, 
where you see the terraces on most of the of their mountains and so on and that was a natural uh, adaptation to capture and to harvest and to create space for growing food uh, which evolved over years and they became so good in that but we don't have that uh, that luxury anymore i agree that very much at the local level i mean uh, <clears throat> Sustainability, financial sustainability is absolutely crucial and we're not talking big money. When I think of the, the service that is provided for water management, not, not the big infrastructure and so on, the capital governments have to pull their weight and they have to put in the money. But I think for the operation and maintenance, for uh, delivering services, um, whether it's irrigation or whether it's um, management of the resource, it, sh it, should be, um, it should be internalized by the beneficiaries. But then you have to build the trust, you have to build the communication lines so that they can see. It's like based on service delivery standards. We shouldn't do it wishy-washy and as and when. It should be something that is really, the accountability is downwards. Uh, if they're happy with the service, they will pay. And it sounds it's more simple than, 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 than uh, uh, than, uh, than it is because it's quite complicated. But it's also once you have started in that path in, in internalizing the need for uh, showing the kind of services that are, that are delivered and the benefits that come with that, whether it's, it's in response to disasters, in response to, you know, whether it's droughts or floods to farmers to this, you know, the, then the, there is, they can see um, that there is a benefit in that and they will put the little that they can they can put and uh, many countries have been quite creative in how do you actually it's not all it's not necessarily in terms of money it could be in terms of harvest it could be in terms of bringing youth in some parts of the farm you know you have to think creatively on how to how to how to address that uh, um, for 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 increasing the the resilience of the overall system uh, the, the different role players have to, each one has to play their, their role. But I just like the, the, the financial sustainability because it's, it's always a challenge because it's not very uh, popular with, uh, in, in a political sense, you know, um, to introduce charges and so on. But And you make a very good point. The, the, the reliability of the service is, is incredibly important in order to convince the beneficiaries to pay. So cost recovery rates are, are low because it's also related to the reliability of the service. So that's a very good point. I have a question here from Tove, uh, Tove Larsen from EWAG. Um, um, and it's a question to both Mark and uh, Amal. So she, she was mentioning that uh, Mark was talking about decentralized treatment in low income countries. Um, and she says it seems very sensible to me, um, especially since um, she doesn't see that sewers m make a lot of sense, perhaps, in countries with strong water scarcity. Uh, Amal, the question is maybe a little bit more directed to you. How, how do you, as, as a World Bank water expert, um, uh, perceive this suggestion? So I, I will respond like many economists, it depends. <laughs> I'm an engineer, so I can. <laughs> um, I, I think really the, the, dis the discussion in many countries indeed is, do you need the networks, a, a centralized system, or is it does the centralized system more optimal? I mean, it, it's really a discussion. What we see sometimes is that in some, um, in some situation, there's a perception that decentralized uh, is uh, less quality, is uh, not as good. So I think there's a lot of awareness to say it's not that one is good and one is bad, but one fits the purpose. And often it's very good that we say, you know what, if you go to the US, Washington DC, the capital city, actually has some, um, some, some decentralized part. I mean, it's not, it doesn't mean if it's decentralized, that it's bad. You don't have to be connected to the network. So I think that's, that's where it's important to, to, to really pass the message. And, uh, and I think it, it's a good question from that perspective. It's more than the technology, it's perceptions of the user and the people. Yep. Thank you, thank you, Amal. Um, Nancy, do you want to take one of the questions in the Q&A? Yep, sure. Um, 
So g given COVID, um, commercial and cargo flights and ships have been impacted all around the world, uh, including Middle East and the Gulf Corporation Council countries. So this has impacted food supply chains globally due to restricted movement. Now countries that were not producing fruit, vegetables and other agricultural produce locally um, given their climatic conditions, have switched to produce at least something locally, 5 to 25 percent maybe, um, though at a high energy and water purification cost. So this is a long question. Um, so how vulnerable is this situation um, for countries in the future in terms of their water resources and their economy? Amal, you want Thanks to a lot. No, no, absolutely. I'll, I'll, I'll start with that. I, I think the whole question, and that's globally, of the supply chain in agriculture, and I tend to say also in water. So the question is, you have a crisis. So it, it's fine that during the crisis, you use more water than usual for different reasons. So that, that's fine. The question is, were you prepared? So let me elaborate a bit. If you had been overusing your groundwater for 10 years, obviously your strategic reserve is not there anymore or is really starting to be depleted. So I think that's where the question on, are you building the resilience today for shocks? So that's the first part. The second part is, um, the question is how long the shock will last? Are we talking about a COVID uh, situation that will last one year? few months are we out of the crisis so for how long the supply chain will be, will be dis disrupted so so that's the question is it broken in some places or is it slower and disturbed so that's where it, in each country you will have to do this analysis but it we see indeed that more countries try to do more nationally and that's that's fine and the system will adjust itself i mean it's a response to a shock over. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I think we, we're, we're close to wrapping up. There was one more question here um, from uh, Prasanta Mohapatra. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. And he's asking uh, one of the challenges in the field is the lack of capacity of stakeholders to, to actually implement the technology. I, I think Ayman was talking to this aspect already when you were talking about the transfer of, 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 of research researchers and, and maybe even professional capacity. Do you want to very briefly um, um, talk to this last question, perhaps? Ayman? Yes, thank you. I just wanted to say something about the previous one, is, is, is looking at, as the question was posed, um, regarding the, the, the it, it speaks to the virtual water. It speaks to the Gulf countries where <clears throat> most of the produce, agricultural produce is uh, imported. Um, and I, I think that Sudan is an agricultural country with huge potential for, um, for uh, food production. Um, I think uh, there is a need to relook at the scarcity value. So COVID has brought this so much uh, sharper in a sense that um, the, 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 the willingness to how much are you willing to pay for virtually produced uh, products in developing countries that are in very much need of, the, of using their land for with the, all the opportunity costs that goes with it. So I just wanted to say that, that this is now brings it very clear to the mind that, well, this is not, it can happen that we don't have an, an alternative, but to go for very expensive option of growing it in with artificial water in cooled uh, air, air conditioned rooms and so on. So I just wanted to say that. The Thank other you. regarding the um, capacity of stakeholders to absorb and implement the technology. I, I believe that the leapfrogging is essential. Um, we need to, uh, to pick up and so on. But at the same time, and we have history and experience, long experience with technologies that are not appropriate, people who are not trained, if something goes wrong, it's broken, it can't be fixed and so on. So the uptake of these technologies, it has to be a full suite, as you said, Roy, 
that it's um, it, it has to be accompanied by the 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 the, the research that is uh, producing it, but also joint uh, and, and and we're losing Ayman. I, I think we need to leave it also at here. I'm and the learning, oh, okay. the learning in this thing, and you're documenting, and you're sorry, sorry. No, we, we uh, lost you for a minute. Uh, uh, okay, so I, I'm reiterating the importance of of the of the of the research and the partnerships. Uh, so it's not uh, we we have to learn from the past um, that the technology has to be internalized. It has to be appropriate to the context and so on. So even the selection has to be done in very close, uh, it's not an economic driver that, okay, I'll be, I, I sell you the most expensive technology. Uh, we have to go beyond that because our existence, I think now it's so connected to each other more than ever before. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I, we need to leave it at this, I, I'm afraid. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Ayman. Thank you, Amal. Thank you, Mark, for participating in this, in this session today. Thank you all listening in to the second day of the Water Institute Research Conference. Thank you so much. Um, don't forget to register for the third and last day tomorrow. So we are going to go to North and South America tomorrow. Um, we'll start again at 8 a.m. Um, EDT, Eastern Time. Um, we look forward to hear from you again. There is a link now in the, um, in the chat box, I think, where you can register. Thank you all for participating and um, uh, once again, Ayman, uh, Mark, and Amal, thank you so much for making the effort to be with us here today and share your experiences. This was a great discussion. Thank you. Stay healthy and safe.